Okay. Good evening, friends. Welcome to King's Crux. And today the topic of discussion is a very, very important topic in uh, of that. That is UVL tract. Okay. Uh, I will talk about UVL tract under three headings. One is the anatomy of UVL tract. Second is the uveitis, the inflammation of uveal tract. And third, I will discuss some image-based questions under uveal tract. Under anatomy, I will discuss about the basic, embryo uh, basic embryology as well as some basic anatomical aspects of uvea. Uveitis, depending upon the location of uvea uh, inflammation, I have split into anterior, intermediate and posterior uveitis. If all three are involved, it is called as pan uveitis. Now, the importance of uvea as a disease is very important for us, uh, clinically as well as for your, as well as for your exams are concerned. Clinically, because any systemic conditions, say for example tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, can reflect in your uvea, and not just that, even a simple trauma can lead to uveitis. So clinically, it is of great significance. Also, from your MCQ's point of view, lots of systemic conditions like like tuberculosis, like toxoplasmosis and others can also reflect in your uvea. Therefore, uvea is a connector. It acts like a bridge between ophthalmology and your systemic medicine. So, learning about uvea or uveal tract now is of high importance. Okay? So, lots of diseases, the main villains will cause uveitis. Therefore, they are our MCQ pearls. The image-based questions, as usual, by the end of this lecture, I will discuss them so that you will be able to answer these images in a better way. So, we will start with the anatomy of uveal tract. So, we will start with the anatomy of uveal tract. Uveal tract is the middle vascular coat of eyeball. Eyeball is covered by three coats or three tunics. The outer corneal sclera, the middle uveal tract, and inside is the innermost coat is the retina. So our concern is uveal tract as of now. Okay. So uveal tract, there are three important parts from anterior to posterior. ICC, iris, ciliary body and choroid. Okay. Look at this picture carefully. This is the eyeball. This outer one is the sclera cornea. The middle part, the dotted areas will form the uveal tract. So anteriorly you have the iris. Middle you have the ciliary body and then you have the choroid. Okay. Now some basics are to be understood now. This is the iris. Here I am magnifying here. This is the iris and this is going to be the cornea. Here is going to be the ciliary body. Some zonules which is going to carry the lens. Holds the lens in position. Now this space between the cornea and the iris is called as the anterior chamber. Between the lens and the iris, it is called as the posterior chamber. Iris is going to be a demarcation between anterior chamber and posterior chamber. Together, AC plus PC is called as anterior segment. Also called as aqueous chamber. Why it is called as aqueous chamber? It's because aqueous humor is going to be filled in this area. Okay. So from the ciliary body, the aqueous humor is secreted. It's going to come like this and it's going to drain here. I'll discuss about the aqueous humor, which is a whole new topic by itself in glaucoma. But right now it is just enough to understand these basic demarcations. Now this is called as anterior segment, AC plus PC. And whatever lies behind the lens, the vitreous, this is the posterior segment. So this basic demarcation has to be understood. So lens separates anterior segment and the posterior segment. Iris separates anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. Some uh, numbers you have to understand. What is the depth of AC? It is 3 mm. 3 mm. This is the eyeball structure. Now what I have done is I have taken a cross section like this. And I have explained it here. Okay. So this is the lens carried with the ciliary zonules attached to this ciliary, uh, ciliary body. Here is the iris. So this is the anterior aspect, this is the posterior aspect. So you get the picture. This continues down as choroid. Okay. So iris. This is the ciliary body and this is the choroid. We will explain about the 
the structures of each part. Now, iris from anterior to posterior, this is called as the anterior limiting membrane. The inner part is called as the stroma. The stroma consists of the vessels, connective tissue, and two important muscles sphincter pupillae and dilator pupillae. Sphincter pupillae causes constriction of your pupil, dilator pupillae causes dilatation of the pupil. Okay. Next, we have the anterior epithelium here. The inner more is the, the, okay, the inner one is the posterior epithelium. Now, this is it with the iris. From the front, iris looks like this. This is the iris. It's like a diaphragm, like a camera shutter, which permits the or limits the uh, the flow of light into this central hole called as the pupil. So they will ask in the exams, what is the diameter of iris? This diameter, it is 12 mm. They will ask, what is the normal diameter of the pupil? The normal diameter is 3 to 4 mm. Two important points to be understood. Now, what I'll do is I take a cross section of this iris. Now, this is the front part of iris. I just magnify. Taken a section. Okay. There are two parts basically. This is called as the ciliary zone, and this is called as the pupillary zone. Okay. The demarcation between these two zones is called as cholerate. It's called as cholerate. Okay? This is to be understood. This is the outer part, this is the inner part. Oh. Coming back to the iris, we have finished the iris. Next is the ciliary body. Ciliary body consists of two parts the anterior plicative or folded pars plicata and bit posterior plain part or a flat part called as pars plana. Ciliary body is called as the dangerous part of the eye because any trivial trauma or any minor immunological reactions can elicit severe inflammatory response from uvea. That's why ciliary body is called as the dangerous area of the eye. Now, past plicata because of the numerous folds and these folds are called as ciliary processes. Okay. The structure of the ciliary body. Very simple. The stroma of the iris continues as the stroma of the choroid, sorry, stroma of the ciliary body. But the important feature is this ciliary body is going to consist of a muscle, and that muscle is called as the ciliary muscle, which is very essential in the accommodation of the lens because ciliary muscle acts thereby the lens accommodation gets, gets adjusted. So, paralysis of ciliary muscle leads to loss of accommodation. Okay, this is of the ciliary muscle. Now, the more important point is the anterior epithelium of the iris continues here as the pigmented epithelium or the pigmented layer, whereas the posterior epithelium continues as non pigmented. So, posterior epithelium of the iris continues as the non pigmented layer of the ciliary body. The anterior epithelium of the iris continues as the pigmented layer of the ciliary body. The importance of the non-pigmented, this part, non-pigmented layer, this is essential because this is the layer which produces aqueous humor. So the non-pigmented layer of, of the ciliary body produces the aqueous humor. Okay. So that is with the, the anatomy of iris and the ciliary body. Now, the anatomy of the choroid. Okay. Now, this is going to be the choroid. Okay. This part is the choroid. And what is the outer uh, core? That is a sclera. So here will be the sclera. Here will be the choroid. Inside will be the retina. 
Okay, this is retina. It ends at ora serrata. Okay, retina ends at ora serrata. So this is. I'll take a cross section like this, like this, and I will explain you here. From inner to outer. So again, this is going to be the sclera. This is going to be the sclera, and this is going to be the supra choroidal lamina, also called as lamina fasca. The space between the sclera and the supra choroidal lamina is called a supra choroidal space. The supracoridal space is going to have two important arteries. One is the short posterior ciliary artery, the other one is the long posterior ciliary artery. So this is of importance. They will ask what are the two arteries in the space, SPCA and LPCA. Now this SPCA will form the choriocapillaries. Okay, so you have different layers here. The layer of large vessels. The layer of Small vessels or medium vessels. Then you have the choroidal capillaries. Then you have the retinal pigment epithelium. Then you have the retina rods and cones come here. So this is the RPE. What is this? Choroidal capillaries. Choroidal capillaries. C C. Okay. Layer of large vessels and layer of medium vessels. The medium vessels are here. The large vessels are. They mostly venules. Okay. So this is the ultra structure of choroid. Now, the demarcation between choroid and the retina is a membrane. It's called as the Brooks membrane. B R U C H S Brooks membrane is the demarcation between the uh, choroid and the retina. This is sclera. Okay. Now they will ask two important questions. Two named layers. The name of this large vessel layer is called as halon. H A L L E R. Halon. Halos layer is this. This is halon. This medium vessel zone is called as Sattler, S A T T L E R, Sattler's layer. So these are the points about choroid. From this, you can understand one thing: that choroid is a highly vascular supply, has a rich, rich vascular supply. In fact, uvea tract has the uh, maximum ocular blood flow of the entire eyeball. It uh, it receives the maximum blood supply, and that is why any systemic associations or any trivial trauma can elicit. Increased immune response because of the rich vascularity, and not just that. Uh, in ophthalmic procedures like cryocoagulation, diathermy, the heat will get easily transferred to the choroid. That's why choroid lacks like a heat sink. It prevents the damage of the sclera as well as the retina. So also in the visual for uh, visual uh, pathway where there's going to be photoconduction, the energy is being transmitted to the. Choroid. So choroid will act like a heat sink, and that is the most important part or the most important function of choroid and uveal tract as such. Okay, so that's it. We end with the anatomy. Uh, but before that, I'll talk about the embryology as well as the anat the arterial supply, venous supply, and the nerve supply of uveal tract. Okay, I'll talk about the uh, embryology in brief. They ask some questions about embryology. You have two important derivatives. One is neuroectodermal derivatives, then neural crest cells. Okay, neuroectodermal two important muscles. The two muscles of iris. What are the two muscles of iris? Sphincter pupillae, dilator pupillae, and the two epithelial lining. Two epithelial lining of what? Of ciliary body of iris. These parts are from neuroectoderm. Two my uh, two muscles of iris, sphincter pupillae, dilator pupillae. Two epithelial linings, ciliary bodies, epithelial lining, iris. That's epithelial lining. Neuroectodermal derivative. 
neural crest cell derivatives stroma stroma of what stroma of ciliary body stroma of iris epithelial lining is not normal whereas the stroma is from neural crest cells the stroma and also not just that stroma of choroid so the stroma of uveal tract is from the neural crest cells melanocytes of uvea are from neural crest cells this is the basic embryological aspect now moving on to the anatomy uh, the arterial supply there are two important uh, things to be understood as far as arterial supply is concerned uh, here is going to be the the eyeball okay uh, the uveal tract okay iris pars plicata pars plana and choroid okay so there are uh, these arteries short posterior ciliary artery spca long posterior ciliary artery lpca arising from the ophthalmic artery this is the ophthalmic artery the ophthalmic artery gives the lpca spca the spca is going to pierce the sclera enters this part of choroid supplies the posterior part of choroid LPC again PSS sclera enters the choroid both of them travel in the suprachoroidal space but LPC as the name implies it is long so it goes long and at this part of ciliary body it forms anastomosis between what between another artery called as anterior ciliary artery this comes from the muscular branches of the rectus muscles so LPC and ACA anterior ciliary artery will form an anastomotic circle called as major anastomotic circle or major arterial circle the circle is formed in the iris okay so how does it look from front this is the iris pupil this is the iris and this is the ciliary body Okay, so the long posterior ciliary arteries will come like this. They form this is the long posterior ciliary arteries. Two come from each side. They spread superior inferior divisions, nasally and temporally. They form anastomosis here, and also anterior ciliary artery also will come and join the party. So this is a circle. This is the major. arterial circle now these gives branches to the iris radial these give branches and all these branches are going to form another circle a smaller circle at this pupillary margin that is called as the minor arterial circle so you have two circles major arterial circle minor arterial circle major arterial circle is formed between the anastomosis of LPCA and ACA. Okay. Regarding the venous supply, it's easier, thankfully, because uh, the arterial supply is very complicated. Venous supply is very simple. One important name you have to understand: venous supply of uveal tract. Single most answer is vortex veins or vena vorticosa. Vortex veins. There are four veins in number. Okay. They drain like this. Four veins will come in number. So if this is going to be the eyeball from posterior view this is the optic nerve coming from the posterior aspect of eyeball here are the four veins like this like this okay like it forms a square like now the superior vortex veins drain to the superior ophthalmic vein the inferior vortex veins drain to the inferior ophthalmic vein so that ends with the arterial supply as well as the venous supply Now I will quickly talk about the nerve supply, which is of high high importance. Now, nerve supply. Our concern is this: iris. What supplies the two muscles, sphincter pupillae, delta pupillae? What supplies the ciliary muscle of ciliary body? Okay. Please, please have a look at this. Now, this is going to be the trigeminal ganglion. Trigeminal ganglion gives three branches. 
as you all know, one is the ophthalmic maxillary mandibular divisions of trigeminal nerve. This ophthalmic nerve is our concern. The ophthalmic nerve is going to continue like this. As what nerve? As the nasociliary nerve. Nasociliary nerve is going to give another branch that is the long ciliary nerve. To this long ciliary nerve, something joins the part. That is, here is going to be the internal carotid artery with the sympathetic plexus around it. It's going to join this. So, the sympathetic nerve supply goes to dilate the pupillae muscle. That's why sympathetic dilation of the pupils. So in Horner syndrome, where there is going to be destruction or there is going to be affected sympathetic nerve supply, there is going to be paralysis of DP causes myo causes myosis. Okay, that is the clinical significance. And not just that, long ciliary nerve also gives supply to the iris itself, ciliary body itself, also corneal sensory supply. This is about the diadem. So you finish this. What is the remaining? What are the remaining two things? Sphincter pupillae and ciliary muscle. For this, third nerve, oculomotor nerves, accessory motor nucleus, called as Edinger Westphal nucleus. Edinger Westphal nucleus. Okay. From this, the third nerve comes. Here is the third nerve. Okay. Now, this third nerve, the oculomotor nerve, is going to relay into this ganglion called as ciliary ganglion. So, this is the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. This is the ganglion. So, postganglionic parasympathetic fibers comes out via a nerve called as short ciliary nerve and supplies two important muscles that is sphincter pupillae ciliary muscle so both of them receives parasympathetic nerve supply from short ciliary nerve which is nothing but oculomotor nerve so any oculomotor nerve or third nerve palsy will lead to loss of sphincter pupillae so there is going to be fixation and dilatation of the pupil in third nerve palsy loss of ciliary muscle loss of accommodation in third nerve palsy this is the clinical significance Okay, so simply put, sphincter pupillae, ciliary muscle, both are parasympathetic. Delta pupillae is sympathetic. So that ends with the anatomy of uveal tract. Next, we'll take up a very, very interesting the uveitis condition. So we'll, so we'll talk about uveitis now. Okay, there are different ways to classify uveitis depending upon the anatomical anterior intermediate, posterior, altogether called as pan uveitis, infective uveitis, non-infective uveitis, granulomatous uveitis, non-granulomatous uveitis. The easy way to learn and understand uveitis is by this anatomical classification. So this is the eyeball and I have explained the uveal tract, okay, the dotted structure. The anterior uveitis consists of iritis plus inflammation of pars plica of the ciliary body. The intermediate uveitis involves the pars plana of ciliary body. In fact, idiopathic in, uh, inter, uh, uveitis is called as pars planitis. Okay? Not just pars plana, some part of vitreous is also involved. So, hyalitis is also a feature of intermediate uveitis. Posterior uveitis involves choroid and retina. Okay? So, anterior, intermediate, posterior, all together called as pan uveitis. Okay? So, when we first talk about the anterior uveitis, Okay, so our topic of concern is anteriorness. In fact, that is the most important part of uveitis. Inflammation, that is uveitis. Anterior. So, I will draw the anterior part here. Okay, from anterior post, you will consider what are the various uh, signs will be involved in anterior uh, uveitis. First, we will have a circumciliary congestion. circumciliary congestion will be seen. Over the cornea, there will be deposits of keratic precipitates. 
Now these keratic precipitates, okay, over cornea, you can have some keratic precipitate deposit over the endothelium or the inner aspect of cornea. These keratic precipitates, <coughs> in fact, the most common corneal finding in uh, anterior uveitis. They're nothing but aggregation of lymphocytes, neutrophils. They form these uh, small, small clumping or aggregates here, keratic precipitates. Keratic precipitates can be either granulomatous or it can be non-granulomatous. Granulomatous in conditions like tuberculosis, you have uh, granulomatous KPs. These KPs uh, are very classical. These KPs are large, greasy, mutton fat KPs. So, KPs or keratic precipitates can be granulomatous, can be non-granulomatous. Granulomatous also called as mutton fat KPs. Okay. So, because of the, the, you know, the, the dense KPs, they will come down, they will gravitate down and they will form a triangle. And that triangle is called as ARLTS, Arnold's Triangle. Where do you see Arnold's star in trachoma? In the cicatrice here or star instead of trachoma, you will see Arnold's scar over the upper tarsal conjunctiva upper, or upper palpable conjunctiva. Here this arm is trying where the kinetic precipitates will just gravitate down. Okay? So this is one important feature of cornea, one important finding, kinetic precipitates. In non-granulomatous conditions, for example, in fuchs, you will have stellate or star-shaped kinetic precipitates. I'll explain to you and I'm going to explain each and every one in detail. But right now just understand these are kinetic precipitates forming Arnold's triangle. This is with the cornea. Then coming to the anterior chamber. What you can observe in the anterior chamber? Hypopion. Pus in anterior chamber. Hyphema. Blood in the anterior chamber. Okay? These are the points to be noted in the anterior chamber. Coming to the iris. This is the iris. This is the pupil. Iris is going to have nodules. This is the mid iris. This is the pupillary border iris. The nodule at the pupillary margin is called as Coppi's nodules. K O E P P E. Coppi's nodules. The nodules present here at the mid iris is called as Busaka's nodules. B U S A C C A. Busaka. Very important image based question. This is with the iris. There are lots of other conditions involving iris. You can have iris pearls in leprosy. You can have uh, iris crystals in syphilis called as the Russell's bodies are also seen. Okay? And in neurofibroma, you have the leash nodules in neurofibromatosis. Important MCQ. So apart from this, what else you can have on iris? You can have blood vessels in iris. That is the rubiosis iris. The radially forming neovascularization of iris called as rubiosis iris. Now we'll talk about something about the pupil. Understand the pathognomonic feature of uveitis is meiosis. In glaucoma, you have a fixed dilated pupil, whereas in meiosis, you have a shrunken, small, meiotic pupil. So when I'm going to give a midriatic pupil, what happens is that there's going to be irregular enlargement of the pupil. Why it happens? Let us see. I'll just take here, okay? See, this is going to be the cornea and the sclera. Sclero cornea. Okay. This is the iris with the ciliary body. This is the lens. Now, see what happens here. The iris is going to make a contact with the lens, anterior lens capsule. If it's going to make throughout for the entire length of the iris, it forms a 360 degree posterior sinicate. It is posterior because the iris goes posteriorly and it's going to make a contact, sinicate, an attachment with the uh, anterior lens capsule. 360 degree posterior sinicate. So what happens here is when I'm gonna give when I'm gonna give a midriatic, there's gonna be this irregular shaped pupil, what you call as the 
festooned pupil festooned pupil this is the pupil this irregular shape festooning of pupil occurs that is called as the festooned pupil now when there is going to be a glaucoma associated okay the all the you know uh, what happens is that the aqueous humor which are being secreted should normally come out and should drain here from the pc posterior uh, uh, chamber to the anterior chamber now when there is going to be a block here a pupillary block what is called as seclusio pupillae seclusio pupillae that is going to be a block ok the seclusio becomes occlusio pupillae the complete pupil may get occluded because of fibrinous membranous exudates ok seclusio will may become occlusio also what happens? The iris bulges forward because it is blocked, so there is no way for the aqueous to escape. The iris is going to bulge forward, forming called as iris bombay. Bombay of the iris. So it forms a funnel shaped AC. A funnel shaped AC. That is the point to be noted about this iris. Okay, uh, because of the so much inflammation occurring here, do you think lens will escape the impact? No. So lens will go for secondary complicated cataract. So the lens will go for a secondary complicated cataract. What we call as the polychromatic cluster or breadcrumb opacities of secondary complicated cataract. One important point I want to mention in this anterior chamber is apart from the hyperpoint, apart from the hyphema, there are, uh, there are important reactions. There is AC cells. The anterior segment cells are also seen. AC cells. You can also have flare. AC flare. What are these AC cells? The cells in the anterior segment. Normally, anterior segment is going to be clear. There's going to be a clarity is there. If there are cells like neutrophils and lymphocytes inside. AC cell reactions have occurred. When there is going to be a break in the blood aqueous barrier, the protein leakage comes out from the blood vessels, thereby causing increased protein deposits in the aqueous chamber. There we have a flare called as AC flare. That's it. To do with the anterior reactors. Now, the treatment aspect of the anterior reactors is very, very easy. Topical steroids is the drug of choice. You can also give atropin. Atropin is going to be a midriatic. So it is going to cause midriasis. It is also a cycloplegic. It is going to relieve the cyclospasm, thereby helping in the accommodation. And it increases the uveal blood flow also. So these are the important points about uh, the atropin. Also, it prevents the formation of sinicin. Okay. But an important point to be noted here is if uveitis is associated with glaucoma. Okay, there's a syndrome called as posner Klausman syndrome. There are other conditions where there will be a uveitis induced glaucoma. So in these conditions, our prime requisite is to treat uveitis first, not the glaucoma. In glaucoma, there are different drugs. Two important drugs what we give in glaucoma are pilocarpin and latinoprost. These two drugs, pilocarpin and latinoprost, both are contraindicated. You should not use in uveitis conditions. They will worsen because they are nutrients, uh, like they are myotics. They cause meiosis, so you should not use them. So you should stick with topical steroids, atropin, but never ever give latinoprost or pilocarpin in uveitis associated glaucoma condition. Very important point. They will ask another question. What is the most common cause of uh, visual disturbance or because of a posterior segment pathology? So most common cause or most common posterior segment, the posterior aspect, no? Posterior segment pathology leading on to diminished vision in anterior uveitis is CME. There's going to be an edema of the retina. Cystoid macular edema, CME. Okay, so that is with the uh, anterior uveitis. And uh, another one point is, they will ask, what is the what is the uh, most common complication of recurrent anterior uveitis? 
the most common complication of recurrent anterior uveitis is secondary complicated cataract. So that is with the anterior uveitis. Then few important points about intermediate uveitis. Very very easy. Intermediate uveitis is going to involve what? Your pass plan. Also part of vitreous. I said highlighters. The pneumonic feature of intermediate uveitis. This is the fundus picture. Here is going to be optic disc. The macula is going to be here. Now I can observe some very important finding here. The exudates, exudates and vitreous will form snowball. These snowball will just settle down to form snow banking. So snowball, snow banking, two important important signs in intermediate uveitis. What is the classical symptom given by a patient with intermediate uveitis? Floaters. Floaters. Small, like Moscow Valentine is the what we say, no? Small uh, insect-like appearance you will feel moving before your eyes. That is called as floaters. It is a classical symptom described by the patient who is having intermediate uveitis. That is with the intermediate uveitis, okay? Then the posterior uveitis, as you all know, it involves not just the core but also retina because of the close conjunction. Therefore, the, the message you get from this discussion is that uveal tract is not a separate coat by itself. It is in proximity, in connection with the other two coats, be it cornea sclera and also your inner retina. Therefore, uh, any pathology affecting uvea will affect the other two codes and vice versa. So that is the point here and uh, now I will discuss about the causes of uveitis.